take your Bibles and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. A familiar passage, but going to get into detail on this. Again, the title of the message this morning, and I, I just... I thought at the beginning of the year, now the Lord gave me the message this last Sunday, I had to get that out, but you know, even right now, I, I get to thinking about, you know, what is ahead, and I don't know about you, but I, I quit watching the news a long time ago, I just did, I'll get snippets online, but I don't want to just sit there and listen to some people just bloviate about, you know, what's taking place. My Bible tells me what's taking place. I love it. One pastor said, you put me on a, desert, uh, a deserted island, give me a Bible, and I'll tell you what the world is doing. That's the truth. That's the truth. All right. So 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I'm going to read the first five verses. Verse 1, now I, Paul, beseech myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am base among you but being absent am bold toward you but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A very powerful portion of Scripture that we're going to look at this morning. I don't know about you, but I need God's power. I need God's help. So let's ask the Lord to open this up to us. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name I pray that by your Spirit, we would have understanding. We would be taught even this morning. Lord, may we trust you. We can trust you, I know, with what you're doing in the world. As to our part of it, Lord, use us for your glory. And again, I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So, once again, in starting a new year and understanding from the last several years what the God-haters have desired to foist on our culture, and they're seeking to do it, I just felt that this is where we need to go. And I'll show you by God's grace. Listen. Listen. There are battles, and you might, you, you might think of others that I list, you know, from what I've, I list here. You might think of other places. I understand that. I tried to be as comprehensive as possible for our culture here. But there are battles that are going on in the world right now. The battle for your family, the battle for the church, the battle for your future but then also the battle for your mind. Let me give you just a brief example of the first three. First of all, the battle for your family. There is a lady by the name of Melissa Harris Perry. Apparently she is a media personality. She's a writer. I saw the video where she made this statement, quote, we have to break through this idea that kids belong to their parents or kids 
belong to their families. Now, I don't know about you, but I hear something like that, and my flesh does start to stir. It really does. I'll never forget, we were, um, I, I was doing concrete. We lived in the East Bay. This was during the time where if a radio station gave an opinion, they had to open up to other people uh, to give a counter opinion. I'll never forget, I was driving in my, uh, my F-750. I had a bobtail dump truck uh, pulling the tractor or the tra tractor or the backhoe. And twice in one day, I heard the all-news station there in uh, San Francisco, KCBS. I heard them do this opinion piece. Basically, it was this. Ah, you know what? We need to allow books in public schools that have filthy language in them. And I thought, you're nuts. You're crazy. So I've never done this before. I kid you not. I'd never done this before. I went home and I wrote a rebuttal. I'm on the job the next day. There's a payphone. I called the radio station and said, you know, you had this thing on yesterday. I want to give a response. Oh, okay. Well, you know, write, write, write it out. I said, I've written it. Oh, okay. Well, when you get a chance, you know, read it to us. I said, I've got it. Okay, read it to us. A rebuttal could only be 90 seconds. I read it to them. It was 92 seconds. I said, I can take care of that. No big deal. She said, hold on just a second, and brought somebody else on and said, now read it to them. So I, I read it to them. They said, can you come in next Tuesday? And so we're doing this job in, uh, it was in Concord. We're doing this big, big job. And my boss gave the okay on it. Not too far from there, there was a, uh, there was a BART uh, train station. And so I ran over there real quick, got on BART. I've got concrete all over me. But I, 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 I rode in to San Francisco and got there. I think it was one Embarcadero, you know, way up top where they had the, uh, the, the station. And... Uh, gave this rebuttal. I didn't realize, you know, how they did this. They played that, they played the rebuttal 14 times. Seriously, that was what they would do. They, you know, they, they ran those things several, you know, about 14 times in a week, and then they would do the, do the rebuttal. But I got to know this lady that was there working. Uh, she was, she, I think she was the head uh, receptionist, nice, nice lady, honestly a nice lady. I went down to the radio station one time and we argued for over an hour amongst other things on corporal punishment. That's crazy. But we had a good time. I mean, it was, you know, it was okay. But they brought on a guy from the California Department of Education that was trying to basically manipulate education, taking things, does this sound familiar, taking responsibility away from the parents and putting it with the Department of Education. I was livid. So this lady that I got to know, I called her and said, listen, I've got somebody that can go onto the radio, on, on the radio um, and, and go head to head with this guy that you're going to be having there. And uh, they said, well, why don't you do it? I said, <laughs> you don't understand who you're talking to. But I got Pastor Dave Ennis, and it was great. He got on there, and he started talking about the biblical understanding of the separation of church and state, number one, and number two, you know, family, et cetera. But Pastor Ron Allen, Brad, I don't know if you remember this. Maybe you didn't hear this. But Pastor Ron Allen called in and, said, and, and challenged this fellow and said, basically, flat out, he asked, who do the children in the state of California belong to? 
He wouldn't answer it. Now, that's the situation that we're in still. But this is part and parcel of what we're dealing with. Elitists, leftists are livid that parents are actually getting up and, and rallying and fighting against things like critical race theory, things like transgenderism, socialism, and basically a godless worldview. They're angry with it. Then there's the battle for the church. Now, this is broad scoped. There's battles going on every day. Listen, if you don't think Satan hates the local church, do a little bit of detailed investigation on the direction of churches at large in the last 50 years. It's really something. In particular, in this, is something that I just mentioned, transgenderism, the LGBTQ situation as well. It's, it's, it's all there. It's all there. I was not aware of this, but this last Sunday, Pastor John MacArthur literally rallied several thousand pastors to preach on this very thing. Because again, churches are being challenged. In fact, and I know this is Canada, but they're our next door neighbor. And believe me, we have viewpoints back and forth with this. There is a bill right now, Bill C-4, regarding sharing God's word with people, is on the docket right now. They are fast-tracking this thing to get through. Listen to some of this bill. Quote, whereas conversion therapy... Now, now you know what conversion therapy is? Let me tell you what con conversion therapy is. It's a mom or dad, friend, pastor, youth pastor, somebody telling a young person, based on God's word, that if you're a boy, God made you a boy. If you're a girl, God made you a girl. Don't let Satan confuse you. They preach this. In fact, YouTube yanked John MacArthur's sermon on this subject from last, from last Sunday. This is where it's getting. Listen to this. Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it is based on and propagates, listen to the next word, please. Do I have your attention? Are you listening? Everybody? Based on and propagates myths. Is this a myth? You better believe it's not a myth. Myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth, I love how they said that in the bill. Assigned to a person at birth. There ought not be any confusion. Let me continue. Are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expression. If you do what they're telling you not to do, you can go to jail for five years in Canada if this passes. Praise God. The same young man that we were reading about and hearing about a year ago, Coates, the pastor up there, when it came to getting the, um, the church shut down, he is there, he and others in Canada, they preached against it, and they actually had this man, what's his name, J uh, James Coates, had him on Fox News, and he said this, that this bill... Uh, C-4 is, quote, anything but loving if it intends to shut 
the LGBT community off from the saving and transforming message of the gospel of Christ. And he is drop dead right. He's drop dead right. See, this is how Satan seeks, once again, another avenue to try and shut down the gospel. If you have believed the gospel of Christ, rejoice. Somebody felt the freedom to give it to you. You received it. Glory. Praise God for that. Absolutely. He said this. He went on to say this. I believe our government is capitalizing on a politically expedient segment of its constituency in an effort to further dismantle Western civilization as we know it. Why? Because Western civilization, to one degree or another, is based on the Word of God. To do this, it must outlaw its very foundation, which is rooted in a Judeo-Christian worldview. Bill C-4 is another brick laid in this effort and is evidence that our government is under the judgment of God. Thinking themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's exactly what has happened. Then there's the battle for your future. For your future. There is a scheme right now to change the world. Now, by the way, I'm mentioning this. Don't get discouraged. It gets better as we continue in God's Word. But there's a scheme, literally, leaders in the media, in the financial markets, and government in the Western world are seeking to change that world. What they don't realize is they're getting the world set up for the Antichrist. Folks, it's going on right now. Are you listening? It's going on right now. Glenn Beck, I've, one of the books I'm reading right now is Glenn Beck's book entitled The Great Reset. Now, you've got to understand something. He didn't give it that name. They did. But I want to read you a portion of that book. I want you to hear this. The America we remember, the America of carefree summers, Saturday night trips to movie theaters, warm family holiday gatherings, and mom and pop restaurants has been replaced with a culture driven by suspicion, rampant fear, and ideological and political tribalism, and dominated by massive multinational corporations. Sure, grandma can still bake apple pies while the family watched a good old-fashioned baseball game, but whatever elements of American culture remain are now superficial. Beneath the glowing stars and stripes veneer, is a terminally ill superpower teetering on the edge. And the worst part is, our most disruptive, dangerous days still lie ahead. In an article published on the World Economic Forum's website, WEF Executive Chairman and Co-Founder Klaus Schwab explained in detail some of the most important goals of the reset. Quote, COVID-19 <clears throat> lockdowns may be gradually easing, but anxiety about the world's social and economic prospects is only intensifying. To achieve a better outcome, the world must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies, from education to social contracts, and working conditions. Every industry from oil and gas to tech must be transformed. In short, we need a great reset of capitalism. Continuing, Schwab and Prince Charles were joined by a long list of important figures in business, economics, and a variety of powerful organizations calling for a great reset, including Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, Jennifer Morgan, the Executive Director of Greenpeace International, Gita Gopanath, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, 
the lead economist at the International Monetary Fund, and Bernard Looney, CEO of British Petroleum. In a speech, Greenpeace's Jennifer Morgan explained that the COVID-19 pandemic offers an, op uh, an opportunity to reshape the world in a way that is reminiscent of the new world order established after World War II ended. This is what was said. We set up a new world order after World War II. We're now in a different world than we were then. We need to ask, what can we be doing differently? The World Economic Forum has a big responsibility in that as well, to be pushing the reset button and looking at how to create well-being for people and for the earth, unquote. Folks, the Constitution is still in Washington. You can go to the place where it's on display. They don't need to physically tear it up. They just ignore it. A pastor friend of mine, of my dad's, went to, oh, Yugoslavia. And he met with pastors from the underground church there. They told him, they said, you don't get it. He says, we have a constitution. It guarantees us freedom of religion but they just ignore it. And that's what's taking place here, and it's going to be for the greater good as far as what they are trying to say. Now, you take these three areas that we've already been to, and really what it comes down to is point number four, is this, the battle for your mind. This is where it's at concerning people, by the way, saved and unsaved. Satan is hammering away at especially the people of God. That's why, you know, you, you consider this, this COVID thing was no accident. You still have people, God's people, that are living in fear. They have not been back to church. They're not reading their Bibles. They've drifted here and there. And it is helping take the spine out of God's people and their command from the Lord himself. This is what's taking place. <coughs> Never have we seen a battle, a blatant battle, for young minds. You, you, you look at what's going on in government schools. You know, from the days of Horace Mann and John Dewey, we, we, can, we can see it. Evolution, listen, hey, that was just a beginning. You know, pulling, I remember in 1963, uh, I was not quite 10 years old, but I remember when the vote came through in the, in the Supreme Court, taking out prayer and Bible reading. And by the way, look at a graph sometime and see what happened to this nation when God was removed and things in different areas just started. Just like that. Just like that. John Dewey, the people revere, said this, quote, there is no God and there is no soul. Hence, there is no need for the props of traditional religion. With dogma and creed excluded, then immutable truth is dead and buried. There's no room for fixed and natural law or permanent moral absolutes. And you wonder why there are people with a smile on their face keep telling women time and again you can murder your unborn child, and it's okay. It will set you free. Or any other thing that you can think of what has taken place, things that we've already uh, read about. So what happened during this time? Well, one of many results 
when it comes to the lockdown, et cetera, the percentage of teenagers who were hospitalized for suspected suicide attempts spiked in 2020 and last year in 2021 during the lockdowns. When it came to young ladies, it increased nearly 51%. For some reason, it wasn't as bad to the boys, but when they took all of the results from last year, the spike was 31%, guys and girls, when it came to attempted suicide. Come on. We know what's going on. Drugs have been flowing like crazy to help people or try to or illegal drugs that people are getting. Why do you think we have the homeless situation that we have now? And there are government officials that are back that have backed away and said, we can't tell these people they can't do this. This is a deliberate attempt for confusion, to tear down culture, to tear down civilization so they can rebuild it. Anybody that tries to tell you differently is either not understanding what's going on or they are deliberately lying. Now, what do we do? We listen to God's word. I want you to go once again to 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Paul has been gentle with the church at Corinth up until this moment. But now he has taken a decided turn. He loves the church at Corinth. He says, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. He wants them to understand. This, this is where I'm coming from. I'm representing the Lord Jesus Christ who in presence of base among you, but being absent and bold towards you, I am taking this turn. But I beseech you, I beg of you, that I may not be bold when I'm present with that confidence. I, I, I want to get this done with this letter, wherewith I think it to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. You see, there were people that were lying about him. Paul is battling for the minds of these believers. Don't go there, but if you read, if you go to the book of Acts, you find that Paul started this church and he pastored it for over a year and a half. You find that in Acts 18. When the apostle left, when Paul left the church at Corinth, to go spread the gospel elsewhere, he was told that there were some complications that came. There were people that came into that ministry there in Corinth, false teachers. They began attacking the ministry and the character of the Apostle Paul himself because this is what they figured. If they could diminish him, they could set themselves up as leaders in the church. They were battling for the minds of these people. And to a degree, it was working. Now, understand this. Every day, somebody is trying to get you to think how they want you to think. That's why it's important to be in God's Word, to know how God wants you and I to think. We just don't have, <clears throat> I, for, forgive me, I've used this illustration before, we just don't want to have the Gilligan Syndrome. How many of you really enjoyed in time past the depth of Gilligan's Island? <laughs> you know, it's just, there's some real wisdom there. So you watch Gilligan. And they're arguing back and forth. And Gilligan goes, 
The professor's right. Mr. Howell's right. You know, Ginger's right. The skipper's right. That's not how we think. We want to think biblically. These people were thinking if they could discredit his message, they could spread their lies to these folks. So Paul comes in and he gives them three things to focus on to think about when it comes to this is not only what I'm doing, but this is what we all need to be doing because we have in Christ the truth. First of all, our weakness. Look at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, I want you to take note of the word war. He does not say, we do not war. No, we war. We battle, but we don't after the flesh. When you examine the writings of Paul, you find an analogy of warfare. Folks, this is where we're at right now. When we're in glory, we have laid, we, we've laid our burdens down. Praise God, we're with him. Right now, it's the nasty now and now. This is why Paul said to Timothy, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. 49 years ago, right now, I was in Happy Valley, USA, otherwise known as Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. Wonderful place. You've got people that are standing three inches from your nose and talking to you like you're in Montana. They're trying to change you. Just like every other military service, they have this thing called boot camp. And they are trying to remake you into what you ought to be for their cause. Hey, we're soldiers of the cross. We're in boot camp every day. This is the gathering of Troop North Highland. <laughs> but you know what? Seriously, this is what, I, I feel sorry for the world. They don't understand community like God's people can have it. That's why we're to pray one for another. That's why we're to love one another. This is why we are to encourage one another. This is why we come together and we listen to God's word. And in this case, the tool of God is some old guy with gray hair. But praise God, it's God's word. Our weakness. We know we have a foe. That will bring up war. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole more armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The schemes. Satan is not somebody that's just leaning up against a, 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 a light post somewhere and when you walk by, he says something like, ah, your mama wears combat boots. That's not Satan. He's trying to tell you right now don't listen to the old guy with the gray hair. He's trying to get you to thinking about what you're going to be doing this afternoon or this week. Folks, we are at war. If you don't believe it, you think about the casualties that many of us know where Satan got a hold of the heart and now they're nowhere to be seen when it comes to the fellowship of the body of Christ. That is sad. That's why Paul told, again, Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, fight the good fight of faith. When he wrote Timothy, in 2 Timothy, he said, I have fought a good fight. I finished the course. I kept the faith. So Paul was passionate. By the way, 
including the church at Corinth, where he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, but I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Bottom line, Satan desires to blind you. And if you don't believe that's true, he's already succeeded. Hello? It's the truth. That's our warfare. Excuse me, that's our weakness. We don't do this in the flesh. Watch this, our weapons. Look at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, now, now listen, I want to do a little bit of explanation here. Paul was human and frail, just like the rest of us. He walked in the flesh. He's trying to say, look, I'm here, I'm human, I'm here. But I'm not coming at you with something like knives or clubs, spears, nothing like this. The weapons that I use and that we are to use are spiritual. They are mighty. They're powerful. In fact, they're powerful enough to pull down a fortress, a castle, otherwise known as a stronghold. Our battles in this world are not waged by argument and strong-arm tactics. That's not what takes place here. Now see, some thought of Paul as being weak. I don't know what he looked like here on earth. But I believe that with everything that he went through, he was not somebody that you would fear physically. I'm sure that he wound up having some damage done to his body because of when he was stoned. So he doesn't strike, you know, this big, massive figure. But God gave him his power. And the same Holy Spirit that Paul had, we have. The Corinthians could relate to this idea of stronghold. We learned this when we were in Israel. Corinth, like most of the major cities in Greece, had an acropolis, which was a fortified section of the elevated part of the city. Located on a mountain near the city, it was a place, the acropolis was a place where the population, if they were attacked, they could go to and they could be safe from those that were seeking to attack the city. Paul was saying this. He's saying, we have power through the weapons of the warfare that God gave us. We have power to bring down those things. Now, I want you to think about this, and I've shared this before, but I want to get it drilled into our minds again because we need to remember this. This is God's Word, right? God's Word is truth. Our God is truth, right? Okay, now please listen. When you got saved, you brought in lies of the devil. Now wait a minute, because that's you were believing a lot of things before Christ. You were believing a lot of things that the world taught you. When you come into Christ, we are to get into the Word of God, and as the Word of God tells us, there needs to be a renewing of the mind. But here comes the devil, and he persuades you You see that little thing that you believe here? Listen, don't listen to those Christians. Don't listen to that preacher. Hold on to this because it'll do you good. It's this, it's that. It becomes a stronghold. Or if a Christian, and I've been down this road, if a Christian gets discouraged, Satan will persuade that person. You know, something like, 
you know, it's just worthless. God doesn't love you. Or, or, you know, you just can't live this Christian life. There can be all kinds of things. If he gets you to believing that, you know what you have? A stronghold. And when Satan gets one stronghold in your mind, he desires to expand. Next thing you know, you're believing lies more and more, not only about God, but about his word, about his people, about the local church, about prayer. It goes on and on and on. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying we have weapons that will bring those strongholds down. And we do. We do. Watch this. Our warfare. Look at verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, I want you to understand, so I I want you to catch this big time. You know what I'm seeking to do right now? By God's grace, been praying for and desiring God to come in and his power with his word go into your mind if there is a stronghold for the Word of God and the God of the Word to bring that down, to bring that down. First of all, casting down imaginations. The word, the phrase casting down means to pull or throw down, to refute. When this took place in ancient warfare, when strongholds were captured and towers pulled down, the defenders were taken into captivity. Commanders would come in, like God, and they would make sure that everybody understood that stronghold is brought down, it is destroyed, and there's a new leader. Look at the word imaginations. That means reckonings, conclusions, reasonings, thoughts. He said, casting down imaginations. Listen, spiritual warfare is not a battle with demons. Demons cannot be saved. They can't trust the gospel. Are you listening? Spiritual warfare is you and God. Spiritual warfare is the Word of God and the God of the Word seeking to get you to realize something that the Word is trying to teach us. There are some that they wind up grasping a little bit of God's Word, but then in the flesh, they take it and they battle with it, thinking, well, this, I know how to do this. Yeah! No. Remember what Paul said We're coming in the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Now let that sink in. When we open God's word, we're not only doing the work of the Lord, but we're seeking it by his power, by his guidance. We can't strong arm anybody. I can't yell and scream and stomp and snort to try to get you to think differently because a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. But if while the preaching is going on, the Holy Spirit comes into the heart and is allowed to do the work, this is how people, this is how people receive the gospel. There are people that are persuaded, absolutely, I can get my way to heaven. No, you can't. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. 
You can't work your way to heaven. You can't do it. That is why we preach God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's not up to us. And so we're seeking for the gospel to get through. We're seeking for Christians to understand by the word of God that it's through him because he told us, for without me, ye can do how much? Nothing. Now, are, are we getting it? Are, are you thinking you understanding? You know, praise God for the gathering. But this is really, as we sit here and we hear God's word, you know, we sing and you know, stuff. This is warfare. This is warfare. Because Satan wants, excuse me, Satan, oh mercy. Because the Lord once again has gathered us together and he says, listen, I, I want you to hear this. You're worried, you don't have to be. My grace is sufficient. And you can cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. See, this, this is what it's about. You can walk out of here thinking, you know what? The preacher didn't mention any of this, but you know, I realize what the Lord's been trying to tell me this last week. I keep coming up with this in God's word. I'm going to be preaching tonight. Last Sunday night, it was Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. Tonight, it's Proverbs 3, 6. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. We're going to learn about that tonight. I'm praying that more strongholds come down. Even just little ones. But this is what, again, it's all about. We're not called to convert demons. We're called to convert sinners by the gospel and to encourage Christians for them to get conclusions and thoughts and reasonings that are based on God's word. And that is through the capturing of the thoughts. Look at the last phrase there. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we speak to the world. We get them to understand that obedience to Christ is trusting him. Remember the people in John 6 that came to Christ and said, what should we do that we might work the works of God? Where do I got to go? What club do I have to join? Where do I have to, you know, so... He said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. There it is. But then, after a person trusts Christ, then we slowly, through the, the, the renewing of the mind, we're changed. We're changed. There was a pastor had a man come into his church and uh, he was just, boy, they were given testimonies and he just thought, this, this, this is great. He had just gotten saved. And when asking for testimonies, this fellow got up, he had just gotten saved and he said, I want you to know that this last week, all I had to drink was beer. And everybody applauded. You know why? Because before he got saved, it was beer and whiskey and vodka and all kinds of things that were tearing up him, his body, and his family. The pastor that, this other pastor that was talking to him about that guy, had, you know, he was telling him about, you know, time passed, this is what he had done. He said, how's that man doing now? He says, he's my Sunday school coordinator. Now, that's growth. You know, if you have had growth this last week in Christ or this last month, praise God. Now, now, now wait a minute. 
if a man here says, you know what, since the beginning of the year, all I've done is look at pornography twice. If your problem before that was you were looking at it twice a day, then praise God. Or drugs, or alcohol, or whatever. Now, if you say, hey, praise God, this last week, I only punched my wife once, we need to talk. But you, you, you get it? You, under, you understand? We love the growth. God loves the growth. But you know, there's something else that we need to understand here. And with this, I'll close. Here we are in this time where there are, battle, there are people battling for the family, for our future, so forth. Ultimately, it's for our minds. We are looking at the world. We're looking at neighbors, relatives, friends. And with the gospel, we are seeking to tear down strongholds. Listen to me now. You're not going to have, and I'm not going to have, the power to do that like I should and you're not to either if that is not taking place in our own lives. I don't know why. Well, maybe I do know why. Just, you know, there's things we wind up getting wrapped up in this world. But the Lord reminded me this morning, Mike, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abideth forever. You know, we can wind up getting wrapped up in things. We can wind up wrap, getting wrapped up in the lust of the, uh, of, of the world. You know, right now is the playoffs in the NFL. And there are people that are absolute Christians that are absolutely living for that more than they've ever lived for Christ. That's not right. We need to embrace this ourselves. Lord, search my heart. If there are any strongholds, please, Show me. For those that have never heard this, I'll close with this. For those that have never heard this from me, I want to share this with you. Because this is important. Over 20 years ago, I was in real, I was in deep depression. I don't know how I got in this pulpit every week. I honestly, I don't know how. And I have since read of other pastors and many pastors the same thing. By the way, I'm not saying this, you know, out of um, trying to be easy, but pray for your preacher. Whoever, you know, pray for your pastor. I wound up going to see a fellow by the name of Jim Benny. He, he's preached here before. You can see his messages on our sermonaudio.com website. Great man of God, great guy. But he was a counselor to pastors. He's counseled well over a 1,000 of us now. On Monday morning, when he and I wound up meeting for the first time, my wife and I were sitting there. He said, Mike, in your heart of hearts, do you believe God loves you? And without hesitation, knowing full, full, full what I said, I said no. He said, eight out of ten pastors he asked that question to say the same thing. I don't believe God loves me. I was stunned, but I still believed it myself. We met, we're talking things through, he's got a program, it was, it was really good. 
Wednesday afternoon, after we've made some progress, Wednesday afternoon, and some of you, again, you've heard this, but Wednesday afternoon, I'm sitting in a chair across from him in his office, and all of a sudden, I exploded out of the chair. And I said, I can't believe this. I am the classic double-minded man. He started laughing. He said, when did the Lord show you this? I said, just now. He said, go back to your room and write down other lies of the devil that he's told you. Folks, I wrote down 13. God opened my mind. Now, if God has spoken to you, don't waste the opportunity. You go home, eat your lunch, whatever. Don't turn on the television, but sit down with your Bible and say, Lord, is there something that I'm believing that is not based on your word? I challenge you. I beg of you to do it. Like Paul said, I beseech you. Because if Satan has you believing one of his lies, guess who's in control in that area? It ain't God. If we're going to do to the world what God has called us to, we've got to embrace this. We need to recognize our weakness we need to understand our weapons and realize we have a warfare going on. But God has given us the victory. Now we're going to pray. This is a time when we need to be thinking about not what the preacher said, but what God has said to you. Let's take the time. It's worth it. We're his. Let's bow our heads.